Good morning. It is good that you are able to join in with us this morning. I welcome you to our service here at Fourth, uh, First Baptist Church of Hope Mills in Hope Mills, North Carolina. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for uh, tuning in on this wonderful day. Uh, a bit cold outside. Uh, understand the temperatures around 25 degrees this morning. And so therefore, <laughs> cold, okay? <laughs> um, but this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, my friend, and let us be glad in it. We have some good word for you today, coming from God's word, and I pray that the message you hear today would be uplifting, it would be um, encouraging your faith, it will encourage you to continue to stay faithful to God and to trust him for your needs as, we, um, as you live day by day. I um, want to go to prayer now as we um, pray before I, I get into the word today for you. Oh, Lord Almighty, we um, take a moment to bow our heads in prayer, thanking you, Lord, for your mercy, thanking you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that you have given to us to, to lead and to guide us in, in close and some uncertain times. We ask your blessings upon the message. We pray for those who are struggling with the COVID and those who have lost loved ones. We pray, Lord, that you will comfort them. We pray also, Lord, for our country. We pray, O oh Lord, that, uh, that all of us are seeking peace. Lord, may we find that peace by joining together and working toward peace, as well as uh, accepting Christ as our Lord and Savior, who is the Prince of Peace. We also pray, Father, for our first responders. We pray for the, our doctors and nurses and, and our school teachers and, and our janitors and those who do our, pick up our garbage each week. We lift them up to you and their families and, our, and their, their lives. We pray for those who have lost jobs and are still waiting some type of a substance to be able to relieve them of their financial stress. We pray for the men and women who are in harm ways, who are at this very moment, very second, uh, defending our country for freedom and for democracy. We ask your Lord to uh, bless them and keep them safe and, and watch over them and their families. And Lord, we do pray and thank you for a great country, the opportunity to worship, opportunity to excel in whatever you put in our hearts to do. We thank you for this privilege. We ask now, Lord, that you bless our message and may you be glorified and you be lifted up. Amen. I would like for you to turn with me in the book of Psalms. Psalm 62. There are 12 verses in this psalm, and I would like to um, read them to you from the NIV version, New International Version. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. How long will you assault a man? Would all of you throw him down this leaning wall, this tottering fence? They fully intend to topple him from his loathly place they take delight in lies with their mouth, they bless, but in their hearts they curse. Find rest, O oh my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depends upon God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O oh people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Low-born men are but a breath, the high-born are but a lie. If weighed on a balance, they are nothing together, they are only a breath. Do not trust in extortion or take pride in stolen goods. Though, you riches, though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. One thing God has spoken, two things have I heard, that you, O God, are strong 
and that you, O oh Lord, are loving, surely you will reward each person according to what he has done. My sermon title this morning comes from that hymn that is written by Ruth K. called In Times Like These. Uh, Ruth uh, wrote this song in the late 1943. A uh, matter of fact, she was reading 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, which says, In the last days, perilous times shall come. And as she read the Pittsburgh newspaper and saw the, war, the World War II casualty list and heard reports of slow progress of Allied troops moving up the boots of Italy, it seems to her that perilous times had already come. Rationing was hitting hard at home, hard. Discouragement was everywhere. How long could people continue to live in times like these? Ruth took out a small notebook pad from her apron pocket and began to write down some words. A melody came to her, her, her that seemed to fit the words she wrote. She had no formal musical training, but she was not trying to write a song that would make her famous. She was just putting down some thoughts on paper, but it happened to be the right song for the right time. As soon as people around the world were singing it, in 1948, the Jones founded a, ra a radio station in Erie, Pennsylvania. And years later, when she was watching a Billy Graham crusade on television, she heard George Beverly Shea sing this song, her song, and tears came to her eyes she said, I can't believe I had any part in writing this song. Here we are this morning, my friends. We may feel that, uh, like, like Miss Ruth, that in times like these, and that song goes, in times like these, we need an anchor. We need, we need some help. We need some support. We need some stability. Our, our message this morning that comes from Psalms, as he, uh, the, the writer tells us in the first verse, uh, he tells us that David was going through some very difficult times in his life. He was being chased by his enemies, and, uh, and uh, things weren't looking good for him. Uh, but he writes this psalm uh, to, to, to us who are here in this 21st century to encourage us to place our faith in the right place and the right people. Uh, he wrote this song because from his personal witness and his personal relationship with God, he was able to see the faithfulness of God in every situation that he found himself in. So he wrote these words. He pins these words for us in times like these. When we are bombarded by uncertainty, when we are bombarded by the pandemic, when we are bombarded by relationships, in times like these, we need a Savior. In times like these, when loved ones are ill and, and sick and it seems that uh, uh, crime is on the, road, on the rise and marriages began to dissipate. Children began to uh, rebel against their parents. In times like these, we need an anchor. In times like these, we need God's word. We need assurance that someone is in control. We, we need assurance that God is on the throne. And I'm here to tell you this morning, according to the, the reading I read to you this morning, God is on the throne. I'm here to tell you this morning that in times like these, God is by our beckoning side. If you're, if you're a believer in Christ and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, your foundation is secure. Your foundation is solid. For those who have not accepted Christ, life can become very challenging. And we'll discover a little bit of that as I go through the scriptures with you this morning. Open up God's word so that it can be applicable to you and your circumstance in the life that you're living today. The word of God does no good if it is not applicable to you and I, if we can't practice it, if it doesn't meet our needs in our current situation. And I pray this morning that that's what my message will do. It'll help meet your spiritual needs in times of trial and in times like these. 
First of all, I want to go back to verse 1 and 2. David says, my soul find rest in God alone. I want you to hang on to that phrase, in God alone, okay? He said, my salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Did you notice the imageries that the psalmist paints of God? Did you notice in that one, verse 1 and 2, how he depicted his relationship with God? Let me tell you this morning, you ought to be able to, as a Christian, you ought to be able to put out an image that represents your relationship with God. God shouldn't be some person that's just in your heart, or just in your mind, rather. God should be an image that you can go to. He could be water when you're thirsty. He could be peace of mind when your soul are troubled. He can be your food when you're hungry. But for the psalmist, he paints the image. The first image he paints of the Lord is that God is my salvation. He's my salvation. That word itself says that he's our rescuer, our hope, our deliverance comes from God. Our salvation is a gift from God through Jesus Christ. There's nothing we can do to earn salvation. There's no amount of good that we can accumulate that will be enough to appease Almighty God. Salvation is a gift. The psalmist says, praise be to the Lord, to God our Savior, who daily bears our burden. God is a God who saves. From the sovereign Lord comes escape from death. Jesus Christ has paid yours and my penalty that we might escape death. And I'm not talking about a physical death. I'm speaking of a spiritual death. That we might escape eternal punishment. The imagery that he paints in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it said, all the wages of sins is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Eternal life. There is eternal death, but there's also eternal life. And Jesus offers us eternal life. We can't necessarily depict what that's like here on this earth, but it's a promise. It's a promise that God has made us because he's our salvation. And in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it says, There is salvation is no one, and there is salvation in no one else. Listen to these words. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Did you get that? There's not a name in history, in all of creation. There's not a name written in any book of history or religious whereby one person becomes the savior of the whole entire world except for Jesus Christ. You can go back and do your reading through the ancient books. There's never been a man who came on the scene of this earth who became the sin, the atonement for the sins of the entire world and took upon our sins. There's never been another man who's been able to do that for us but Jesus. Our salvation comes from Jesus. 
Every day we live comes from Jesus. He rescues us. He rescues us from many things that many times we we least, we least are aware of. The psalmist says, he put his faith in God because of God's salvation. Look at the other imagery. He talks about God as his rock. When I travel from Petersburg, Virginia, to Washington State, I pass through South Dakota. And I remember seeing the National Monument, or what they call the, um, the shrine of the, the presidents, uh, the face of democracy, the, the, the different ones, and it was four of them, uh, Theodore, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. And as I passed by, I saw their faces painted on a rock, on this big rock. And you can see it from miles. And I thought of the, uh, the person who did it, the one who uh, crafted it. But more and so, I thought of that giant rock. David says, the Lord is his rock. He's not a pebble. He is described, Jesus is described as a stone that keeps everything together in one of the books in Hebrews. He's the cornerstone, Jesus is. But David says that God is his solid rock. There's so much we stand on today that's sinking sand. There's so many things that we put our faith in that will sink. But David claims that God is his solid rock. You and I need something solid in the days that we're living in. We need the assurance that everything is going to be okay. Isaiah refers to Jesus being a stone that is tested, a costly stone for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in it will never be disturbed. You will have trials and tribulation in this life, Jesus warned you. And he warned all of us, as human beings, we are going to go through some stuff. But he's talking about a spiritual foundation that will not be destroyed. You can't, just, you can't touch that. It will not be shaken, as we see in the scriptures. With God being my salvation, God being my rock, he said, I'm firmly established. David is telling us of his testimony. You as a Christian ought to have a testimony. That's when someone asks you about your relationship with God, you ought to be able to say, he is my rock. He's my salvation. And notice the other imagery. He's my fortress. We pay a lot today to find communities that are gated. And the reason why we do that is because we want protection. We want the right people to come in who's supposed to be in and keep out the bad people that's not supposed to be here. So, so, we, so we find these gated communities that will give us a peace of mind. It'll give us some security that the people that we're living next door to supposedly should be okay. Not always. But listen to this. All fences, all man-made fortresses can be breached. Case in point, a couple of weeks ago, fences around the White House was breached. I don't care how many walls you build and who builds them, they can be breached. If you don't believe me, ask the people who build them. <laughs> They'll tell you the weak spots. 
They'll tell you where areas are vulnerable. But the psalmist said, the Lord is his fortress. Day and night, he had built a hedge around them to protect them. I remember the song that my mama used to listen to by Sam Cooke. Oh, man, I love his music. And it was called, Jesus, be a, friend, be a fence around me day and night. David found God to be a fence, to protect him. There's all kinds of people today who wants to come into your life and breach what you have. Telemarketers, always trying to breach your privacy. Sometimes a uh, baby and his kids, meaning all the grandkids, they come and want to breach your quietness and your privacy. There's always somebody or something trying to get into you and evade you. And when your defenses are down, when your defenses are down, you are most likely to be breached. You're most likely to, to, to let down the guards and the barriers that you, that you have built around you. But every barrier that we build in ourselves can be breached. But David says that God is his fortress. He has built a hedge, hedge, a bit of hedge, uh, a hedge around him. So he paints God as being this fence. A fortress. What a beautiful image. What a beautiful image for those of us in Christ Jesus. That no matter what's going on, what political flavor of the air, what is so great that you as a child of God, he has you in the palm of his hands and nothing can breach you. Nothing. What a great God we serve. God is the one who protects you. I like Psalms 121. I look to the hills from which cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. He who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall watch over your life. The Lord shall keep you from all harm. The Lord shall watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. What a fortress. David said, put your trust in God, folks. Quit putting your, 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 your trust in things that's not going to last. Then he talked about another image. He talks about hope. In times like these, we need to go to someone who gives us hope. I'm not talking about wish for things. I'm not talking about hoping for this to happen, hoping that you, 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 you win the jackpot. I'm not talking about that. David says, he's my hope. It is something more solid. He, he's already know what it is. He said, I see the Lord as my hope for living. My hope is for, for everything that I have. He is the very essence of my life. My friend, when Jesus, when God becomes the every essence of your life, when God becomes the air that you breathe, when God becomes the food that you eat, when God becomes the energy that runs through your body, when the God becomes the eyes that you see out of, the hands that you use, when God becomes that part of you, my friend, he is your fortress. There's nothing that can touch you outside of his will. We talked about in our Bible study last week of being servants. And what it like to be a servant of God. What is it like to be a servant of the creator of the universe? 
the one who created it all. Think about you being a servant of the one who created the moon, the stars, the galaxies. And before time itself, he has called you and me to be part of that. He's our hope. Our hope is not in fragile people. Our hope shouldn't be in politics. We shouldn't get torn around and lose our faith because of some political e election. We shouldn't be mad with other Christians because of their differences and their beliefs and who they believe in and who they voted for. When our hope is in sink and sand, this is what it changes us to. We forget, for being, we forget to be child of God. Instead, we become fighting among ourselves. David says, I found my hope in God alone, in God alone. In doing so, guess what happens? He also, in another imagery, he finds God to be his refuge. In times like these, where do you go when your soul is troubled? Where do you go when your marriage is falling apart? Where do you go when death has hidden very close to home? Where do you go that you're in this pandemic and, and you barely got enough to get food? Where do you go when, when, when the bills are mounting up of your homes and car bills and, and other kind of bills? Where do you go? Where do you don't go when trouble comes on you unexpectedly? David says he has found that God is his refuge. He has found that even though circumstances might not change, he has found that when God, and God being his refuge, a place that he can go and hide out, a place that he can go and consult and pour out his heart. That's what it's about. Things may not change in your life. Bills may continue to mount up. People will still get sick. Family men will still catch the COVID. Whatever the situation is, David has found in his personal relationship with God that God was his refuge. When he was being hounded by his enemies, when he was being talked about by his neighbors, when he felt uncomfortable, when he was sick, when mis others misunderstood him, he found refuge in the arms of Almighty God. Where do you go when trouble mounts on you? When unexpected things dump itself on you? Where do you go? I hope you have found God to be a place of refuge. And David says all of this to say this. Faith in God leads to unshakability. Faith in God leads to unshakability. Notice what he said. I will not be shaken. I know God is for me. In Psalms 27, verse 13 and 14, uh, the psalm said, I'm still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I'm going to repeat that. Psalms 27, verse 13 and 14. I'm still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Be strong. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Keep trusting God. He also says that uh, uh, and, and, and God being our refuge, he said, I will not be shaken. My second point I'd like to highlight right quick. God is not a tottering fence. He's not easy. 
There's a lot of things that we lean on and we fall. We lean on our family members and they don't always come through. We lean, we lean on, on trusted friends and they don't always have the answers. We, we lean on material things and we see it vanishes away and, and, and we pack it away or we, we throw it away or we put it in a closet somewhere. We, we, we lean on our new cars in months, it'll be smelling like something else, I don't know. We lean on our own strength. Only to find that when we go to the doctor for an appointment, they said they done discovered something inside of us that they need to check it out. But when you lean on God, when you take your burdens and your trials and, and you place your life at God's feet. 1 Peter chapter 5, and verse 6 and 7 says, Humble yourself therefore under the might of the hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time, casting all your cares on him. When you lean on Christ, man, you got a sure foundation. There's peace that the world can't give you. Jesus said that. My peace I give to you, not like the world. The world peace lasts just for a second. You got to go and try to find it. But when you have Jesus' peace, it's already inside you. You can smile. You can walk out among your neighbors and, and wave and, and have a good spirit. You're not looking for peace. You are the peacemaker. You're one of the instruments that God uses to foster peace in our community. God is not like a tottering fence. Too many of us today, we lean on the wrong thing. And you lean on it long enough, guess what's going to happen? You're going to topple right over. You're going to be thrown, about, thrown, 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 up, thrown overboard. It don't take much. Sometimes all it takes is someone to say something bad about you. Sometimes the worst people that can hurt you are family members. Not always those people outside that you think are your enemies. Sometimes it's your family members who are your enemies. Sometimes when they gossip about you, they can easily topple you over. Topple you over, rather. God is not like that. He's not persuaded by what people say or what people do because he's God Almighty. We can trust him. That's what this whole psalm is about, trust. Placing your faith in the right person because everything else is going to dissipate. Everything you see on this earth is not going to be here or you're going to leave it. You know what I say, a man or woman began to live? A man and woman began to live when they first understand that they're going to die. Now, I don't mean pardon it up. I don't mean that. But when you first come to realization that you're not going to be here forever, and that you have a short time of being here forever, I think of someone the other day that their father passed away at 95 or 100 or whatever. That's a short time compared to eternity. There's others who have lost their loved one. I think of Hank Aaron, who baseball, and I think of uh, uh, the, the guy that's uh, on television a lot, I just passed his name, but who recently died just the other day. A lot of people lived a long time, but eventually we die. But, but when I think of these individuals, the one thing that they did in the midst of death, and that's what you and I got to do. In the midst of death, we got to learn to live because death is coming. You can't wait around and go to the funeral home making plans for to die. Make plans to live. Now do that. I'm not telling you not to do it. You ought to. Make plans. But don't forget to live. Because living is a gift from God too. But be careful how you live. 
What psalmist says in verse 5 and 8? 5 to 8. Trust in God alone. Now, I told you I was going to come back to that phrase. What does it mean? No attachments. No other attachments. He kept repeating, if I'm not mistaken, it is used four times in that passage. The writer's emphasizing alone, God alone. Not your mama, not your daddy, not your brothers and sisters, but God alone. Who you trust? God alone. Well, can I take my dog? God alone. What about my finances? God alone. What about my girlfriend, my wife, and my children? God alone. No other attachments. No other attachments can give you life but God. No other attachment can give you the meaning of life but God. You can attach yourself to many things in your careers and so on and so on, but there's nothing that's going to give you meaning in life but your attachment to God. That brings meaning. That brings joy. That brings peace. You don't have to go around pretending. God loves you as you are. He knows you. He sees you. From eternity, he sees you. We spoke about that a little bit last week about Nathan. When the Lord said, I saw you under the fig tree, my friend. How did you know me? I knew you. Always known you. Isn't it comforting to know that God knows us? Other people may not know us. There are some things we don't want people to know about us. And that's okay. But God knows you. God knows you and has accepted it all. You share some of your secrets with others, they may not accept you. They may walk away from you. But not so with God. You can trust God. And you can trust him all the time. That little song says, call him up. Call him up on the main line. Call him up. He's right there. He's on the main line. Get on the main line and call Jesus up today. Don't talk to your family members. Don't talk to your preacher. You get on the main line and you talk to him. You pour out your heart to him. Don't go to no Bible commentary. You talk to God. He tells you why in verse 9 and 10, why we need to place our faith in God. Look what it says. Low-born men are but a breath, the high-born are but a lie. If weighed on a balance, they are nothing. Breath and a lie are nothing weighed on a balance. In the ancient scales, they use a scale to weigh everything. But when you put a breath on a scale, it weighs nothing. A lot weighs nothing. Then he says, don't trust in extortion. He used the word stolen goods. Life is transit. It's transitory. We, 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 we don't we don't have much time on this earth. We're none of us. I know we may think that we do, but we don't. I said the best way to live is to live with the mind and say that you're going to die. Because if I know I'm going to die, I'm going to try to live the right life. I'm going to try to live a life that is pleasing to God. I'm going to try to live a life that is pleasing to my neighbor. But most important, I'm going to try to live a life that's pleasing to God. If I know that I'm going to die, then I, I can live. <laughs> no bills follow me when I die. Now, they may follow my family member, but they won't follow me because I can't pay them. Live for God alone. You don't got no bills when you live for God alone. Life is transient. Then he goes on to say, 
as I mentioned here, two things. Man is the puff of air. It reminds me of those um, astronauts who go through their training and they are floating around in the um, assimilation place there to get used to what it's like to be in space. That's what God says about putting your faith in people. They'll float away. He said, putting your faith in money, it too will float away. I wanted to read something from Proverbs. Um, this is what Proverbs says about money. Now, by the way, I'm not against money, okay? <laughs> I want you to understand that right away. <laughs> yeah, if I had it, I, I appreciate it, and I know what to do with it. Serve God with it and help my fellow man or give to charity, all right? So, so th th I'm not preaching against money. I'm, wh what I'm saying is, is that if you, if you rely on it, if you put all your weight on it, it may fly away. This is what Proverbs says. Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Cast but a glance at riches. Oh, he said, just look at it. And they are gone, for they will surely sprout like wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. That's Proverbs chapter 23, verses 4 and 5. Notice the writer gives it, put it in perspective. He said, have restraint when you got it and when you get it. But remember, it's going to fly away. Children are going to beg you out of it. Grandchildren are going to beg you out of it. Your, your, your debtors, the people that you owe money, they're going to beg you out of it. Charity is going to beg you out of it. It's going to fly. Don't put too much weight on it. But instead, trust God. My last point is this. The psalmist reminds us of God's goodness. Look what he says here. This is a promise here. This is a promise. Look what he says. One thing God has spoken. Two things have I heard, that you, O oh God, are strong. Stronger than the mountains. Stronger than the eagle's wings. That word strong means powerful. You, O oh God, can be relied on. I can't even rely on myself. I forget my glasses sometimes. That's, that, that's, what, that's, that's what this pastor talked about. Don't you even don't trust yourself. Walking out without your keys or, or locking them up in the car. Leaving your wallet on the counter of the store. Now, that's not good. But you see how fragile we are? And yet we think we're so strong. We think we got everything under control. And then take but just a breath of air and we're gone. David concludes with God's promise. And you, O Lord, are strong in that you, O Lord, are loving. God is loving. When God created humanity, he did not create it to destroy it. When he curated all human beings of all nationalities and all race and all ethnic group or whatever, when he created them, he created human beings to love them. The problem is that we don't love ourselves. When you don't love yourself, you can't love your wife. You can't love your children. You can't love your neighbor. People who don't love, don't, first of all, they don't love themselves. People who have a hard time loving is because they've never been shown love. But God loves you. That means he's accepted everything about you. Your past, your present, and who knows what's going to happen to you in the future. You already got that under control too. This God that David is talking about is the same God can be yours through his son Jesus. 
You could have the same kind of personal experience with the God that David is talking about in this 21st century. One of the things I have our church doing this year is reading through the Bible. Why? Because I want them to get to see God in different facets. I want them to see God in different ways. Sometimes you'll see God being angry. Sometimes you'll see him being loving. You'll see him providing for his people. In the many ways that you'll discover God is the same way that God reveals himself to you and I. Y'all get that? I have our people to memorize a scripture verse once a month, Isaiah 40, 41, 10. Can anybody recite that for me right now? <laughs> I know you're not here, I'm just joking. <laughs> but here's the thing. You get to know God by reading his word. You get to know his promises. And while so many Christians are fruitless, they want promises of God, and they keep praying the same old prayers, and then they're not answered because they don't know God's word. They don't know what to ask for. I'm going to close, my friend, but i tell you what. This has been a good message for all of us today. God is loving. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. The same verse that is cited in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, for he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God hadn't gone anywhere. If anybody has moved, it's you. When you stop giving to God, when you stop serving God, when you stop communing with God, you are moving away from God. It's not God's fault. And by the way, just because you experience a punishment doesn't mean that God is punishing you. God doesn't punish you. You punish yourself. You make choices and decisions that you uh, bring hardship on yourself. God doesn't do it. But he will deliver you from it. Let me close, my friend. We tend to think we are self-sufficient. We complete an education. We work hard in our professions. And we plan for retirement. We often think we have it all under control. But when difficult times come into our lives, we remember how helpless we are without Christ. In Romans chapter 5, verse 6, it says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless. By the way, we're still powerless. We can't change our nature. We can't change the way that we operate. We are who we are. But God can. We can't change our biases. We can't erase the hate and the anger from our hearts, but only God can. But even with all of that going on inside of us, he still saved us. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. If you're living today, you're ungodly. I'm ungodly. There's no godly person. We may act godly, but we're not because our hearts are often tainted with something. Our salvation and strength come from our daily lives with Jesus. Y'all probably tired of hearing me, right? It's okay. Sometimes I can get tired of hearing myself. Ask my wife. But let me close this morning by encouraging you. Get serious with your relationship with the Lord. Quit playing church. Quit trying to act like you're religious. Be real. Give your heart to the Lord daily. Don't wait until Sunday. Don't wait until a, a crisis comes and then you're calling on Jesus. Get to know him before the crowd and the, and the, and the, and the crisis comes because they're going to come. Quit playing church. Quit playing religion with God. And be like David. Trust him. One of the things I try to do when I go to the store, 
Before I get out, I say a little prayer. Lord, help me with my temper if I run across something or somebody that rubs me the wrong way. Lord, help me in my spending because you know I like this thing and I mean, I mean, I need to get it. But Lord, help me to focus in, here's the other part of that prayer, on the people that need a word from you today. Help me to focus in on somebody. It may be the cashier that needs a word today. It may be, it may be somebody that needs to hear a word. It's going to be okay. You'll get through this. But how do we get to that point in our lives? You get to that point in your life by accepting Christ. You get to that point in your life when you say, I surrender all. You get to that point in life when you are at peace with yourself. You can live with yourself. You have no bad dreams about yourself. You, you, you can, when you get to that point when you accept your flaws, there are imperfections in you. There are imperfections in me. You get to that point in your life where everything you have lays on God. You have rested on him. That's salvation. That's coming to know Jesus. Do you know him? Who are you trusting today? What are you trusting in today? Who are you leaning on today? Watch out. They can fall over. Let's pray. Almighty God, you have once again spoken to our hearts. You have given us the words of eternal life. You have given us a word that we can live today, that we can go and speak to our neighbor today, that we can go in the community today. You have given us a word of solidity that will solidify who our faith is in you. You have given us assurance that all that comes our way, all that we experience, God is our salvation. God is our rock. God is our refuge. God is our hope. God is, our, is, 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 is everything. God. We thank you, Lord. Forgive us of our sins. Get us in right standing with you. And trust you only. We thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for eternal life through his name. We give thanks. Amen.